Good morning, everybody. I'm Margot Carrington. I'm the director of the Foreign Press Centers. I want to welcome you to this briefing today, as well as our audience in New York joining us by digital video conference. I'm extremely pleased to introduce Admiral Samuel Locklear III, commander of US Pacific Command, or PACOM, the combatant command responsible for the Asia Pacific region. You've been provided his full bio, so I won't go into those details now. Uh, and Admiral Locklear has kindly agreed to give some introductory remarks uh, before we take your questions. I do want to stress at this time, though, that we will not allow multi-part questions since we have a large audience. So please keep your questions brief and to the point. And without further ado, let me introduce Admiral Locklear. I ask him to take the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, aloha and good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be able to uh, to speak with you and answer your questions a few minutes this morning. Uh, let me begin by just saying, um, uh, first of all, the Asia Pacific region of which uh, our Commander in Chief, President Obama has assigned, uh, and Secretary of Defense Hagel has assigned me responsibility for, from a military perspective, as we as we manage uh, U.S. Uh, relationships across this area of responsibility. Uh, it's a vast area. Uh, it covers about 51, 52 percent of the globe. Uh, in that, it has the largest object in the world, which is the Pacific Ocean. Uh, most people don't recognize it, but you can take all the land masses in the world and push them together and put them in the Pacific Ocean, and you still have room for a couple of more continents. Uh, in this AOR, there are two of the three largest economies in the world and seven of the ten smallest. Uh, two of the most populated nations in the world and the smallest republic. Uh, the Asia Pacific is the engine that drives a global economy. Uh, there's eight trillion dollars of two-way trade in this region. Fifty percent of the world's cargo trade moves in this part of the world and seventy percent of all the shipborne energy assets move in this region every day. It's also the most militarized part of the world. Seven of the world's ten largest standing armies are in this part. The world's largest and most sophisticated navies are here, and five of the world's declared nuclear nations are in this area of responsibility. Now, it's not without challenges. Uh, certainly from severe weather patterns uh, through natural disasters that impact a large population, potentially impact a large population of the world. Uh, as we know today, there's about 6.8, 6.9 billion people in the world, and well over half of them live in this part of the world, and that number is increasing. Uh, there's transnational threats from terrorism uh, to drug trafficking to illegal activity uh, to uh, human trafficking and slave trafficking. There are historic and emerging territorial disputes that you're all very familiar with. There will be a continued growing competition for water and food and, and energy as the region grows. And of course, there is instability on the Korean Peninsula that continues. Uh, the rise of China, the rise of India, and how they play as uh, global economic and regional military powers uh, is, is being determined as we, as we speak. Uh, and there's no single governance mechanism in this vast region to managed all the security relationships. Uh, there's many complex bilateral, multilateral, growing multilateral relationships that have to be contemplated. So in conclusion, there's a lot going on in the Pacific AOR. Uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to command all of the fine uh, men and women serving in, in the U.S. military and the U.S. Pacific. And I look forward to ask, answering your questions today. Thank you. Okay, if I could ask you to please wait for a microphone, and when you have it, uh, please identify yourself and your outlet. Uh, okay, and no multi-part questions again. Okay, we'll start here in the middle. Right here, the second row. Thank you, Emerald. Good to see you again here. And uh, it was reported by a Japanese media several days ago that the U.S. has a joint battle plan with Japan to take back the Senkagos and Diaoyus if China occupied that. And it also said that you are the major official who get involved in this plan. But the Chinese foreign minister has said that the U.S. side has denied that reporting. 
Would you like to clarify that again? Thank you. Well, I'm not uh, in the habit of talking about how we do planning with any of our allies for contingency, so I won't comment on on that today. I would say though that, you know, there's five U.S. allies are in in my area of responsibility, and we do a broad range of planning with them to make sure that the alliance, all the aspects of the alliances, are well understood, and that ranges from how we interact every day, day to day, how we train together, how we live together. How we socialize together, how we plan for human disaster response, uh, how we uh, look at a broad range of contingencies. Uh, so, uh, uh, I believe that what I can say is that of these five, five ally alliances today, they are, are as strong and as competent as they have been in history. Thank you, Admiral. Um, China recently Can just. You oh, I, I'm Ching Yi Chen with Phoenix TV. Uh, China recently just unveiled its uh, submarine, uh, nuclear submarine, um, and also a POA official say China will need at least 20 uh, nuclear submarine to protect its uh, national interests. So, how do you see the increase of China's Navy power? Thank you. Well, I'd, I'd refer that question to the, the leadership of the PLA to determine how many submarines they need or think they, they need. Uh, I would say, though, that I think we all have to be cognizant of the balance of military power and making sure that as the, the region this vast grows, that we are careful not to over-militarize it in any particular area. Now, I recognize that uh, the Chinese will uh, as they look at their global security environment, as they look at their global economic concerns, uh, that they will have a, a desire and a need to build military assets that will ensure uh, the security, and particularly the security of the seas, which is very important to, to all of us. Um, so uh, you'll have to ask them about how many, how many they need, though. Okay, and we'll take a question in the middle, the lady in the middle here. Thank you so much. My name is Xue Jia from CCTV, China Central Television. My question is about, uh, according to the official announcement that the U.S. Navy is going to deploy 60 percent of um, the fleet uh, in Pacific region by 2020. However, we can see that uh, John Kerry is on his seventh trip on Middle East. So some experts say um, the U.S. Navy is have some challenges in pivot to Asia. So. Um, what, what is your opinion, and how do you think uh, at this moment, the, uh, especially uh, so such as the f uh, future and around China, and also uh, some experts say it's quite difficulties for uh, America to pivot to Asia. Uh, what is your opinion? Thank you. Well, as you look at the, the U.S., uh, the U.S. is a global power, has been for a number of decades. Uh, global powers generally have global navies that can support uh, freedom of the seas, that support commerce, that provide security for the global e economic environment to develop. Uh, and as we work to shape and size our navy, just like any other country does, uh, we make decisions about where it's best positioned. Uh, now, in this uh, next century, the, uh, as I said earlier in my opening remarks, the Global Economic Center, the center of, of where most of the trade that's going to happen with the U.S. will come from, will be predominantly from the Asia Pacific. So it would seem uh, to me that uh, uh, positioning a larger portion of our Navy into the world's uh, largest ocean over time would not uh, be something that be viewed as unusual, particularly since as I said, I think our, our economic focus and our security focus will continue to be in the Asia Pacific. So to the degree that the, the Navy uh, uh, in Asia Pacific will have challenges, uh, you know, we, the, the, the U.S. Navy and the US, all the U.S. military forces that are under my command uh, work very closely with those of our allies and our partners. So uh, the security in the region is about all of us, not just about the U.S. Navy or the U.S. military presence in one place or the other. Second row. Yes. Hi, my name is Takashi Oshima from Japanese newspaper Asahi. Uh, my question is uh, President Obama and President Xi uh, discussed earlier this year about uh, how these two countries can enhance 
some sort of meter meter dial or uh, trust building process. So my question is, um, why do you think you have these two countries have to do that? And how much, as a commander, how much are you concerned about uh, some sort of uh, risk of the accidental collision because of lack of the communication or lack of the trust? Well, I think in all uh, our alliances and our partnerships, and you know, we have a growing strategic partnership with China, uh, that it's important that we communicate on all levels of uh, our society and our government. So to have the militaries uh, not communicating with each other uh, just doesn't make a, a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, th this it's a different world. We're very connected in many, many different ways across all of our societies. Uh, it's not just uh, one or the other. It's very much inter interconnected. So it's important that that military leaders, as I do with all of our allies and all of our partners and all of our global partners, that we establish relationships that let us understand each other. Uh, those understandings and uh, lead to a degree of transparency, and transparency leads to a degree of trust, and trust leads to ability to prevent miscalculation. I mean, look, there's always going to be things that that countries disagree about. It's just the nature of the world, and there's always going to be um, uh, friction points that can lead to uh, a potential miscalculations. And the last place you want those miscalculations occurring is at the military level. So the, the more understanding we have of, of each other, I think the less chance of those, those miscalculations occurring. So what President Obama and, and, and President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping said uh, was that um, uh, we ought to look at some ways to improve that those those that mill to mill connectivity so that we have the right dialogue and that it's in the, the right place at the right time. And we're doing that. Okay. Uh, gentleman in the fifth row right there. Oh, right there, Barbara. Yeah. Hi, Admiral. My name is Feng Feng Wang with China Xinhua News Agency. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, last week that Chinese Defense Ministry has lodged a complaint uh, to, to Japan over, its, it, over the intrusion of its warplanes and warships into a live fire Chinese Navy drill. Do you believe such behavior on the part of Japanese runs the risk of miscalculation and uh, misjudgment? Thank you. Well, uh, I would say that, <clears throat> that operations that are done by militaries around the world are often observed by other militaries. Uh, we can name many examples just in the Asia Pacific in the last year or two where there are announced exercises and, and other navies uh, either participate or observe them. Um, my uh, estimation of what I know of this event, and I was not there at the scene, so, so I, 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 could, I could be uh, uh, I could be uh, not completely knowledgeable of everything that was perceived, uh, but what I see was that it was not an abnormal operation, an, an abnormal um, event to have them observe it, uh, uh, the exercise in the way they did, and should not be viewed as a provocative act in my view. Okay, gentlemen on the end there. Hi, Admiral Nathan King, CCTV America. Um, you said that the five alliances in the Asia Pacific have never been stronger. So will you here today give your commitment to those allies that if they're attacked, even if it's over uh, islands that are in dispute in the various seas, that you would come to their aid? Well, you're asking a military man a diplomatic question. So, so, so I'll defer that to the, uh, to the diplomats to deal with the the intricacies of our treaties, because they're all treaties we have are all different in, in some ways. And the, you see, you see some, uh, some wiggle room in their interpretation? Uh, that's a question for the diplomats to answer. Well, my, the question you have to ask me is that do we, are we prepared to execute, as I said earlier, across a broad range of alliance uh, requirements to each other? Are we prepared to do that? And then I'm at the I am at the service of my leadership, diplomatic leadership, as are my counterparts in our alliances, to how we would, uh, how we would go in and 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 answer the call from our leadership. And you're prepared to do that. Sorry, uh, no, no follow-ups. Okay, we we got a few there. Um, take a question from the back in the middle there. Yeah, she's got it. 
Thank you. Matthew Pennington from Associated Press. Um, Admiral, have you been concerned by the uh, increase in violence in Kashmir between India and Pakistan and the threat that poses to the ceasefire they have? And when um, US and NATO forces draw down um, next year from Afghanistan, are you can, do you think there's a risk that militants who are fighting in Afghanistan today could switch their attentions back to Kashmir? Well, certainly I'm always concerned about uh, uh, any, um, any uh, border tensions of any kind uh, or tensions between any, any nations within my AOR or even those that, that border my AOR. And in particular, uh, the relationship between India and Pakistan is one that uh, I think has a long history uh, that has, a, um, has the opportunity to continue to move forward in a positive way and that uh, border clashes, I think either, either country would say that it's not in the best security interest for those to continue, particularly if they want to move into the 21st century. Uh, now the question on where um, terrorists will, uh, will transit following any major exercise, I think is, a, is a, 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 a question beyond my ability as PACOM commander to, to tell you where that would happen. Uh, I will tell you though that across the region with all of our allies, with uh, a preponderance of our partners and our emerging partners, uh, we have a pretty robust dialogue about how we understand uh, the flow of terrorism, uh, how we would work together to manage the flow of that terrorism, and uh, we're thinking about it more and more uh, each day. Uh, and this includes our dialogue with our, our, uh, our partners both in India and in Pakistan. Okay, question here from the front. Uh, microphone, please. Uh, my name is Cameron. So I'm working as a reporter for VOA Cambodian Service. I have a question for Admiral about um, two uh, Cambodian-born U.S. Uh, armies. They, uh, they were separately charged with the corruption and uh, also leaking information to Cambodian government. Um, some reports say that uh, it's impacts to the U.S. national security. So how it's impact and why do it impact to that? Well, I, it's not appropriate for me to talk about the specifics of what those two uh, military members were charged with, not in this particular forum. Uh, I would say, though, that, uh, uh, that you know, the aspects of counterintelligence uh, are in a military organization are always troubling uh, and always have to be um, assessed as they, as they occur. And there has to be, in all of our countries, we all work very hard to ensure that, that uh, the impacts of these types of things are limited. Okay, we'll take a question from the back. Gentleman with the glasses there. Oh, sorry. No, I meant this row further, further up, right here. Yeah. Hi. Good morning, sir. Um, my name is Joe Tashimabukuro with uh, Japanese newspaper Ryukyu Shinpo. Um, I I remember that um, the U.S. Air Force was supposed to uh, decide what air base to deploy CB-22s or sprays in um, Pacific area. So um, my question is, I like to ask. Uh, has the U.S. Air Force has uh, decided what air, air base uh, they will deploy CB-22 or space? And uh, if okay. you have a conclusion, thank you. Uh, all right, let me uh, start that question by uh, f framing a little bit. Uh, one is with any of our allies, including our very important alliance with, uh, with Japan, uh, we don't do anything <laughs> without the concurrence of the Japanese government with our military forces there. I mean, we, 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 we live within the, the requirements of the, the, the established sets of rules that, that, that we talk about and we work together on. Uh, the importance of, of the V-22 and MV-22 and CV-22, which you know have, have because I think unfairly been, uh, been looked at for a lot of different reasons, but, uh, but uh, they are a incredible asset when it comes to a broad range of, of uh, military activities, including disaster response and humanitarian relief and all the things that, that we have to, to plan for. So uh, 
you know, are, is important to the U.S. and I think to our Japanese allies that we keep the very best assets that the U.S. military can produce in this alliance, uh, and, uh, uh, and we're committed to doing that. So to the degree that at some point in time we will want to put CV-22s in to improve the, our response in the alliance, then, then we would like to do that. But we have not made a decision on where we would ask the Japanese to be able to take these, and we will have a, a, a good dialogue with, our, with the leadership of uh, both the mil Japanese military and the government when that time comes. Okay, third row, this gentleman here. Sorry, Barb. I raised my hands more than 10 times. <laughs> See, it uh, pays Senator off. Senator Reed with SBS from South Korea. Uh, my question is on North Korea. Uh, uh, what is your assessment of the North Korean uh, nuclear missile threat? Uh, do, do you assess that they, they did, uh, they developed uh, missile, uh, uh, nuclear missile capability that can reach to the United States? And what is your uh, response to that? Uh, what is the better option to uh, our uh, uh, negotiate a settlement of North Korean nuclear uh, issue uh, through six-party talks or building up a uh, missile defense system in your AOR? Well, let me take the, uh, the first part of the question. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the end state for North Korea is that they must denuclearize. And I think that's been made clear by uh, not only by the U.S.-South Korea alliance, but most of the other people in the world have said this is the right thing, is for total denuclearization of North Korea. And the sooner, the better, from a military commander's perspective. But now, to the question of uh, do they have the capability, um, I think you'd have to, first of all, do, ask the question, does... North Korea want the world to think they have the capability, and the answer to that is yes. They want us to believe they have the capability. So for a military pers planning perspective, when I see KN-08 road, mo road mobile missiles that appear on a parade on a, in a North Korean military parade, um, I am bound to take that serious, both for not only the peninsula, but also the region, as well as my own homeland, uh, should we speculate that those missiles have the could potentially have the technology to, to, to reach out. So um, whether they're real or not, or whether they have the capability or not, um, they want, the uh, North Korea regime wants us to think they do, and so we plan for that. And so we plan for it, uh, one, uh, to defend, uh, uh, and we're fully committed to defending our homeland. That's my number one job. Um, my, my next number one job is to defend alliances and the region. And uh, we uh, are committed to have the uh, assets available to, to be able to do that in a way that, uh, uh, that uh, protects uh, peace and prosperity in the region and our own people. Okay, we'll come to this lady in the middle here. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, 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 the guys on my left and right have been called upon to ask, and I thank so, you so much for this opportunity. My question, uh, my name is Jenny Illustre. I'm with Malaya Philippine uh, News Daily. My question is in the uh, assessment uh, uh, of the region, what do you think or what would the leaders think would be the next flashpoint or next, what, what are they watching for in which region the next flashpoint would be? Yeah, you know, well, that's a, good, that's a good question. I wish I had a crystal ball to tell you. And even if I had, I'd probably be 100% uh, uh, sure to be wrong because uh, we always seem to, to get, get not, not exactly get them right. Um, first of all, I think we should recognize that Asia Pacific has been a peaceful place, relatively peaceful for a long time, and that we should, as a peoples and as a military, we should expect it to remain peaceful, and we should expect all, all parties out here to respond, particularly militaries involved, to respond uh, responsibly, uh, to look for opportunities to de-escalate and maintain peace rather than create friction that would cause an escalation. Uh, certainly the things we've been watching most lately, besides the, the issues of North Korea, I'd say that's probably the place where I think the most danger for the, the world at large exists is on a nuclear North Korea that 
is very unpredictable. So I think that's the number one place. Uh, number two is to make sure that as the region works through all these territorial issues, that this doesn't turn into a flashpoint for, uh, that would disrupt peace. Because it's really, if you think about it, it's, uh, it, there's a lot at stake uh, over something that could be worked out through international law, through, uh, through compromise, through decisions that, that could be made at, at heads of state. And we should, we should as from a security environment, continue and ensure that the diplomats, the leaders of these countries, have the ability to continue the dialogue. So that's my goal is to, to give space for dialogue, to give peace to, and prosperity for, the, for those processes to work. A gentleman with the glasses, fourth row there. Uh, Yong Jian De from China News Service. Uh, it is reported that U.S. and China militaries uh, are going to hold a joint exercises of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief next week. Do you have any update on the joint exercise? Well, I've been briefed on it because my Army component commander um, uh, in Hawaii, who runs those forces, has been looking forward to this opportunity for some time. But, you know, when we start with things like HADR in our relationship, uh, there are areas where we, every, every country in the region shares commonality in that purpose. And so uh, they're good vehicles. Number one, we get something out of it. We learn something. We're better prepared tomorrow than we were yesterday. Uh, and in relation to our ability to do this with, with our uh, Chinese counterparts, uh, these type of exercises give us a good place to start and to kind of get, in, get into the rhythm of, and of, of understanding and trusting each other. So I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be a great exercise. Uh, gentlemen, right here. Thank you. This is Lalit Jha from Press Trust of India. Uh, welcome to Foreign Press Center. Uh, India and U.S. this week have started their Malabar exercise. And when the Prime Minister was here, I met the President Obama at the White House. Uh, they issued a joint statement, part of which there was a separate sheet on the joint defense cooperation with the two countries. What do you see as a PACOM commander? Where do you see the significance of that statement, joint statement on defense cooperation? Where do you see India, U.S. defense cooperation going forward? Thank you. Well, I think it's, a, uh, first of all, a very important joint statement. Uh, and I think that it outlined uh, uh, clearly the direction that we want to go together. Uh, I had been given, we had been given in the Defense Department some direction from uh, the administration, uh, I think, last year on how we should uh, start working and working our plans to develop a longer-term strategic relationship with our Indian partners. Uh, it's good for the security of the region. It's good for our own national interest. It's good, I think, for the Indian national interest. Now, we've had uh, growing military-to-military -military, uh, uh, coordination for some time. You mentioned Exercise Malabar. Well, that, that exercise has been going on for well over, I think, a decade or so. And um, it's an opportunity for us to get together as navies. It's an opportunity to work. Uh, uh, generally, they're held, I think, every other year or so in the, in the Indian Ocean. So it's an opportunity for our... Uh, U.S. military ships to to understand the Indian Navy, to understand the Indian waters, to help uh, work together on on the types of uh, of uh, contingency things that we might plan together to work on. Uh, we do similar types of things across other branches of the service as well, and those are I think uh, quite productive, and I believe they're growing. Uh, we're also uh, looking at ways that we can pursue together some maybe some joint ventures or joint sharing of uh, the ways we go forward on military, some of the military equipment that we might build together. So um, we're looking, for, looking forward to a, a growing relationship, uh, uh, military to military with the Indian military. Okay, this lady in the third row right here, Barbara in front of you there. Hi, Admiral, welcome back to Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, Taiwan has Sorry, recently- what is your affiliation? Uh, Liberty, Nadia Chow with the Liberty Times, Taiwan. Taiwan has recently received Apache helicopters from uh, the U.S. And do you think there's an implication for these military assets for the you know, regional uh, disaster relief and humanitarian assistance? And some congressmen uh, suggest you know, in a letter Taiwan should be uh, invited to join RIMPAC. I wonder what's your assessment? I, I remember I asked you this question before. Thank mm -hmm. you. Do you remember the answer I gave you before? <laughs> You probably do, I'm trying to. 
Well, um, first I would say that, uh, that those types of helicopters have a tremendous multi-mission role across, uh, across uh, all aspects of what you might you know, think about doing with them. So they clearly have a built-in HADR. I think in, in any disaster we've seen anywhere in the world, and, and preponderance of, of natural disasters occur in the Indo-Asia Pacific region in my AOR. It's just the way it is. And there's always uh, a not enough vertical lift to be able to take water and supplies and food and, and those things into particularly stricken areas where uh, they may have been damaged by earthquakes or floods. So, so I think they have great utility, multi-use uh, capability. Um, now to the question of Taiwan and, uh, and RIMPAC, uh, you know, we are, um, um, at, at this point in time, uh, I think, uh, first of all, that's a policy decision that would have to be made about w whether or not that would occur or not. And you know the, the, all the policy implications for why that, that would occur. Uh, our primary con uh, role, our primary goal today, is to ensure that the uh, that the, the cross strait stability is continues to be stable and is promoted. And so we want to do the things that improve the opportunity for success in that stability, rather than try to find things that might make it uh, less stable. So to the degree that that. Uh, we would throw uh, an exercise like RIMPAC in that discussion. We'd have to have a long policy discussion about the implications and the pros and cons of doing that, uh, not only between our relationship, U.S. relationship with Taiwan, but also our, uh, the stability of the region in general. So that's the, that's the dialogue we'll have to have. Okay, I'm sorry, but we'll only be able to take uh, one last question. Uh, we'll take it from the back, the gentleman back there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. My name is Seung Hee Bak from Jungang Ilbo, a South Korean newspaper. Let me ask you about uh, uh, what uh, transferring wartime uh, operation and control to the Korean government. Uh, as you know, now, nowadays Korean government won it, uh, won't, uh, put it off until when they are ready. And as a Pacific commander, uh, what's your opinion of that? Well, I would say that my opinion after uh, looking at this for the last 20 months or so is, as I said earlier, that the alliance, uh, this particular alliance uh, as well, is, has never been stronger, uh, both from a, a, a unity of, of mission, but also as, as well as a capabilities. Um, and, but there are things that we continue need, need to continue to invest in from a an alliance military perspective to ensure that we can carry the alliance with the right credible equipment and the right credible command and control and the right types of things that, that make the alliance capable and that will require some investments and investments on both sides of the alliance and we have recently had dialogue about that and, and, those, and tried to make sure that we both sides of the alliance understood what those investments and the types of things we needed to do to ensure we're prepared. Uh, to the degree of, of whether we're going to, to be at uh, uh, OPCON transfer, which is commonly referred to, um, it's always been a conditions-based uh, decision. Uh, but we have, uh, as leaders, military leaders, is that we are moving towards a, a 2015 date of next year that would, that would result in that OPCON transfer. And so uh, whether the, the decision will be made between the leaders of the country to delay that or not, It'll be based on what are the conditions of that time. But what we don't want to do is to delay ensuring that we have put the right things in place uh, to, in, to make sure that the, that the alliance is as viable as it can be in the future, uh, waiting on some decision about OPCON transfer, because it's really not that important of a decision. The most important decisions are the, how do we, how do we uh, build the organizational structure and how do we equip and man that organizational structure to be successful in this century. Well, I'm sorry that we don't have more time. We will have video and uh, audio tapes for you and a transcript later today as well. Thank you very much for coming and thank you to Admiral Mahalo. Thank you.